What's up guys, happy Tuesday. Welcome back to another episode of Eat, Train, Prosper. Today is our follow-up to the episode that we started last week for our November Q&A. So this is part two. If you haven't listened to part one that released last week, you can go ahead back and give that one a listen. But before we jump into the rest of the questions from last week, Brian, what's going on? Hey dude, yeah. Uh, if y'all don't know, we've been dealing with some uh, some internet things in the background here before getting going, so we'll see how far we make it today. But um, four quick updates from me. Um, we've had at least one sick kid for the last like twenty running days. Maybe we've had like one or two days in there where both of them have been in school, but the last three weeks have been uh, kind of difficult as far as. Just normal life things, getting all the work time in, getting the workouts in, not splitting stuff up, not running back and forth from school when we get called that some kid is, you know, got green mucus coming out of their eye for no reason. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's what's going on over here. Um, as far as my training goes, uh, one cool new development is that now the, uh, Brian's program over on the Paragon training app with Train Heroic is now offered as a standalone. So you can, you don't have to buy all of the Paragon programs, which are $49 or $69, depending on what bundle and and, uh, access you want. You can buy Brian's program and train with me just for a solo price of $39 a month and get that program alone. Um, So that's been pretty cool. We've had like 10 or 15 people kind of jump on with me and it's been rad kind of communicating with people and seeing progress and and all that stuff. So um, as we enter... Today, I'll be entering week two of my cycle, and I am legitimately floored by some of the adaptations that have occurred in week one um, since before deload week. So I kind of alluded to, or maybe I specifically talked about a experience I had while following RP back in 2017, Um, but they always, you know, the way RP kind of builds volume and and effort... um, by the time you would reach deload week, you would need it. Like your body would be crushed, your mind would be crushed and motivation crushed, right? Um, But you go to failure that week before deload and then you kind of recover during deload and you come back and you expect some of these like super compensation things. The first time I ever did an RP cycle, I had one of these weird adaptations where I think it was something like six reps to failure with the hundreds um, before deload. And then after deload, I came back and hit like the hundreds for eight or nine and it was like three RIR. So that's like something like a five rep improvement, like something crazy like that. Um, And I've never experienced anything like that since until this last, uh, the end of the last cycle into the current cycle. So this isn't just one movement. This happened to me probably on five or six movements uh, in week one, where I would note that I was say, hey, ex- random example, I was hack squatting uh, 580 and I, I hit seven, but it was a zero RIR. Like I could not have possibly done another rep. Then I do deload and I come back and I'm in week one and I throw 580 on again. And I'm like, I have to go to three to four RIR but I get six reps. Um, So where seven was zero RIR, I'm getting six with like three to four RIR. And so this type of crazy occurrence happened on a number of movements across the board, a dual cable lateral raise, um, a chest fly variation, a pendulum squat. It happened on pendulum too. Same thing as the hack similarly. Um, So anyways, just one of these weird things that I'm still kind of working through in my brain. And so I'm not sure if this is just all positive and I'm like, Hey, my training cycle worked because I worked really hard and then I flushed fatigue and then I had the adaptations or if I should look at this as man, maybe I pushed myself too hard at the end. Uh, I was so fatigued that it was just masking my fitness on a level that, you know, is, is too much. Like I wouldn't want that much fatigue. Um, So I don't know if it's a positive or a negative, but um, either way, it's been pretty cool this first week to see uh, those types of adaptations occur across the board with each movement. And so as I jump into week two here, I obviously don't expect anything similar from week one, um, but it's kind of cool to see that from deload week forward. Um, And then two other quick updates. My knee uh, PRP stuff, I'm on nine weeks out now. 
And I literally, for the first time, had a, a few moments where I could sit down in the bottom of my squat, in my squat chair. And this is something I like to do, you know, two to five minutes every day. But I've been unable to do it for the last nine weeks because since PRP, it's like kind of uncomfortable and there's a little pinching if I just like hang out at the bottom of the squat. Um, so there were a few moments where I was able to get to the bottom of the squat with body weight and just kind of sit there and hang out for a few minutes with no pain or restriction. Then I, you know, go about life or I sleep and try it the next day and it's kind of back again. Um, but it seems like things are happening, that improvement is occurring. And um, I'm very much looking forward to getting back to that consistency of sitting in that squat chair two to five minutes every day, continuing to do that for life and be that 80 year old that can still kind of sit down in my squat chair and do whatever. Um, final update here. I realized a uh, few weeks ago that I was clenching my teeth super hard while um, going through like the difficult reps of a set. And uh, my dentist pointed out that I was grinding my teeth at night, which isn't actually true. Um, and then I told her that I think I'm clenching my teeth while I train. And she said that that could have the exact same effect as grinding teeth at night. Um, so I bought myself a mouth guard and then I, I put this on my story yesterday. And of course, after I buy myself a mouth guard, uh, someone writes me and says, hey, you should try this mouth guard, which is specifically made for like you know, performance and uh, proper breathing patterns during exertion and, and all this stuff. And so I went and looked it up and like there's, it's scientifically backed and it seems super cool. So I just spent an additional $29 to buy the Airwave mouth guard. So if anyone else uh, on my story, it seemed like so far, it looks like 78% of you guys clench your teeth while you train. And this is, you know, over two or 300 votes at this point. Uh, so if you're somebody that clenches your teeth while you train, you may be having similar, uh, grinding type effects on your teeth, which is obviously not good for long-term wear and tear. And, uh, I don't have any experience with this airwave mouthpiece, but, um, you know, the one I bought on Amazon was 20 bucks and this one was 29. So, uh, if you are going to buy a mouthpiece, maybe give the airwave a shot. It's A I R W A A V E. So two A's in the middle there. Um, and that's it for my updates. So what is going on with you, Aaron? So, I, I mean, to be completely honest, I, for, for the listeners out there, like Brian briefly mentioned, I was having a hell storm of internet issues and I am currently recording this episode tethered to my phone's LTE. So I didn't really get to sit and think about my updates for the week, but the one off the, the few off the top of my head, I have finished the 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 fourteen day flush that I had mentioned last week or two weeks ago on, on the podcast. Um, Monday, as a, as in yesterday, was my first day back to like normal life. Um, I'm still keeping caffeine out, so uh, I took a two week break from even having decaf coffee, and I've put that back in yesterday, which I do. Just I'm just one of the people who really enjoys the taste of like a black coffee, so that's brought me back some joy. Um, got some more decent training in towards the the weekend the the flush was rough on training uh, i know it's bad when i don't even want to go like i was literally going out of principle <laughs> and one of the when you were talking about the the uh <clears throat> the adaptations you were having and maybe you were just like fatigue was way too high it's one of the things where like I wish I knew more to talk around the actual like s specificity of it or specifics of it, but I wouldn't say like my energy levels were like that wildly different. Cause I think like, you know, two weeks ago on the podcast, I talked about how like some days I would be like yawning on the way to the gym and stuff. And I would get there and it would just be like the epinephrine kicks in, the cortisol kicks in and I would have these like amazing training sessions. Like that did not happen when I was on this. I was Interesting. What I ended up doing was changing my programming and kind of doing like a little bit of auto regulation so that I wouldn't get like super down on myself because my rep drop offs were bad. I would go from like, and it's even more kind of notable when you're training, you know, like I'm doing like a lower volume, kind of lower um, rep ranges right now, like seven to nines. So what, what I would do for like the nineties for like a set of eight the week before I was getting for like five, like, and that wow. just, that, that, it's hard to stay motivated when you know you're just going to get your dick pushed in and not get close to any of your numbers. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so I went in there and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do like some myo rep type stuff. I'm going to do like one or two sets and just kind of 
push it, get the stimulus that, that I'm looking for, uh, and then move on. And I was in and out in like 40 minutes sort of thing, just to like able to keep me remotely desired in going. So now that I'm adding more food back in and stuff, I'm excited to see how quickly uh, those things return or reverse again. But uh, that was like the kind of the big one. And then I guess the last one for me, I briefly- Hold on, hold on, on real quick, real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Um, the- uh... The combo of cutting caffeine and cutting food, I mean, that makes complete sense that that would happen. Like, I don't think that you would expect to go in and be able to either match or improve your numbers. Like, I kind of feel almost as if in your program, like in the future, when this occurs, it probably makes sense to write in or strategically plan this in a time where you're like, hey, I'm going to need like a two week like active recovery period or uh, some sort of like extended deload or whatever it is, you know, um, because that then you, you actually can go into the gym and not feel like you're missing out on what you should be doing, uh, but you're doing exactly what you should be doing, so to speak, you know? Yeah. And I think... The caffeine one's hard. I did pull caffeine the actually the week before I started the flush. So I'm on like over three full weeks without any caffeine now. Um, and for me, the interesting thing there with like the caffeine is like the, the research is at three to six milligrams per kilogram. I don't go near those numbers because I wouldn't be able to fucking sleep. Um, but even with like, I might do maybe a hundred and thirty, hundred and forty like milligrams of caffeine per day. Um, which isn't even two kilograms or grams per kilogram for, for me. Uh, but it still messes with my sleep. Like the one positive was that first week of the flush, I was sleeping like a king. And that's when I pulled the caffeine, like, you know, a handful of days before. But I did get to train with one of my clients. And what was really cool was when you were talking around kind of splitting off the, the or how you guys at Paragon have split off the bees program to its kind of like standalone program. He was telling me, like, I think two weeks back, we were talking about, he's like, hey, I'm considering like switching to Brian's program, you know, because he was just, I think, running like the four day physique. And I was like, yeah, I think it could be a great experiment for you. And I think I have, I know I have at least two clients doing that, but potentially three that have all switched nice. uh, to that. That's so we awesome. met up in Richmond. We trained at this place called RVA Iron, which was hands down one of the best gyms I've ever been in. Um, it was so badass. It really made me excited for. Um, when we do move back to the States, like full time and settle in somewhere, just to like go to a gym that like I can choose, like, oh, this is where I want to go. Yep. It's not like a circumstantial sort of thing. Um, and we followed the, 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 I guess the second lower body session, um, that day. And it was a lot of fun. They had like just all the equipment in the world, old strive pieces, King pieces, the nebulous or nebula, um, leg press. Like it was, it was just like a playground of every piece of equipment I ever wanted sort of thing. That's awesome. You did the the second leg day on Brian's program? Yeah. So it was like the the, the standing cool. standing uh, ham curl, the seated yeah. leg curl with the pause in the length end, um, seated leg extension with a pause in the short end. And they had the Strive, the OG Strive leg extension. So we could actually like yep. set it up to overload the short position by loading the weight there, which was a lot of fun yep. to be able to actually like do it optimally. Um, yep. they had a King strength systems, uh, hack squat, which I put up on my story and that I hack saw squat that. is looks sweet. gangster because there's no stop. Like you, if, if you just want to RPE die, it will just straight up pin you <laughs> to your heels in your asshole and you're fucked. And it's like, use it your own risk, which I love. Right. Perfect. I hate when the yeah, companies yeah, totally. have like a, you, do, you shouldn't go lower than this. Um, and then there was like, I feel like one other thing. Oh, we, 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 uh, did a little bit of off program and didn't do the, the single leg elevated lunge, um, because there was re not a great place to set that up. And instead we did one set on the nebula leg press. Perfect. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, really cool that you guys did that together and that you got to experience that gym. It looks super sweet. Yeah, it was really, really cool. So anyone in the area, I would highly recommend making a trip out. We're going to make another trip this week. I told Jenny, like, we're going to see some friends like near that area. And I was like, we're going to that gym on Friday. <laughs> so sweet. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah, but that's that's it for uh, me. Yeah. Sweet. Let's jump into the question. So we got through nine of the 21 last time. And so it looks like we have uh, 12 more. 
So uh, try and be as quick as we can with some of these. For a shortened bias exercise, is it better to overload the short range the most or have drop off in the short position to better facilitate a hold at that position? So this is kind of a complicated question. So let me kind of frame it up with some context for you guys. Essentially what they're asking is like, so so the example Aaron used where he has a strive leg extension, it's kind of like a prime leg extension where you can load it at one of three arms and then where you load it basically makes that part of the movement the hardest. The cool thing about being able to adjust resistance curves is you could do exactly as this person is asking in this question is, so when you get to the top of the leg extension, do you want that to be the absolute hardest point? So essentially the weight arm holding the weight would be at the gravity line, uh, right as your legs are at the top contracted position, or would it be better to have maybe the hardest point be just before you get to the short position. So maybe that weight arm will cross gravity like 20 degrees before the short position. And then as you get short and you lock out your legs, the, the weight arm is kind of moving back the other way. So therefore you're able to facilitate an easier hold at the top because it's not the absolute hardest spot. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting question and I've thought about it as well. Um, personally, when I set mine up, I usually do not make the short position, the absolute hardest spot. Um, mostly because, and I don't even know if this is right. It just feels right to me, but because if I were to do it that way, I would be so limited on the amount of weight I could use. It would be almost like half or 60% of what I can use by just sending that hardest point like 20 degrees lower. Um, on top of that, I think that by using more weight and by making that hardest point a little bit lower in the movement, you're facilitating a slightly more mid-range overload movement, which may have a little bit more impact on hypertrophy. Um, and then B, you're just able to use more weight, which is going to be potentially more mechanical tension. Um, still, I don't know if that's right. Like there's still part of me that's like, if you're going to do a shortened exercise and you're like, Hey, this is my short exercise for the quads or for my rec fem, then maybe the best thing is to actually make the top of that movement the hardest and be like, you know what, if I have to use 60% of the weight I would use otherwise, then that's okay. Because this movement is not meant to be my mid length and movement, you know, I'm going to go to a hack squat next and, and in the hack squat, I can, you know, hammer that area just fine. So, um, so I don't know what the right answer is, but I know I have my preference. Um, I hate holding the short position on any movement. And so for me to hold the short position where that is the absolute hardest place, it's just not something I would, I think I would psychologically like enjoy or want to do each week. So that's kind of where I stand on that. Yeah. So, um, I, well, actually, first of all, there was a, a thing, a, a, a note that you made, and this is only, I only know this because I've been, had this kind of strange hobby of researching some of these older, uh, equipment manufacturing companies. So prime bought all of the engineering rights and like man ma or manufacturing rights and engineering of strive. So oh, that is why they're so similar because Prime basically bought it and then restarted recreating it. And then cool. uh, to a very similar akin, not to derail us too much, uh, Rogue Fitness bought all the Nebula engineering rights. So the if you look at the, the Rogue leg press that they released like a few years ago, it's like pretty much a, a clone with some s small differences to the Nebula. Um, it, I, I don't just, know Nebula. Like, is that is a is that a resistance modified one as well? Kind of like Primer Strive, or is it just a different? No, it's just like their hack squat and leg press are incredible. Like they're so okay. smooth, you you get a crazy range of motion. It's like what you would wish every leg press was like. Mm. Um, so yeah, any listeners out there, just Google it. Google like the Nebula, N E B U L A, um, leg press. And then it's just really, really well built. And then if you Google like the Rogue Fitness one, it's pretty much a, a clone because they bought the manufacturing rights to reproduce it. So anyway, sweet. Um, I getting back to the question, I would agree with what Brian says. I am not sure if this is better or optimal, but when it is absolutely hardest in the fully shortened position, 
I feel rather confident saying like for this leg extension movement, that is probably one of your weakest positions. And if you make it hardest where you are weakest, you're really limiting the amount of, I guess, overall stimulus you could get from, from the, the leg extension. Um, and it personally, I feel like it kind of bothers my knees a little bit when it's like the absolute hardest right there at the line or shortened position. So I like to have it a more overloaded in the mid range. And then you get a little bit of a drop off in the fully shortened position, which is actually allows you to really adhere to like a, a pause at the fully shortened. I feel like any other time it's really heavy there, you're kind yeah. of doing your best um, or you'd have to reduce the weight so much that the first, you know, whatever, 90 some degrees of, of range of motion is quite easy for you. Yeah. Again, I'm not sure yeah, if I that's, think that's 100% the percent right, but that's how I feel about it. Yeah, no, I think that's really well said. And I agree. What, what you said kind of made me think about how if you do set it up so that the short position is absolutely 100% the hardest point, then inevitably based on, you know, the way these machines are designed and the, the pendulum uh, effect of them or not pendulum, uh, the cam kind of effect of, of the way the machine is, it would essentially necessitate that the bottom of the movement where it's lengthened would have almost no resistance. And so I think just for the fact of making sure that there's some resistance at the bottom, given, you know, the amount of research we have at this point on the length and position and everything, at least wanting some tension there, um, I would, for that reason, not make the top the absolute hardest point as well. Yeah. Okay. So I'll kick this one over to you. How do you handle having the flu fever and cough so hard not to do anything? Rest fluids, electrolytes, and a little bit of fruit. All right. And I, uh, this is always, this is a great question. Cause I get this from a lot of my clients and they'll, and they'll be like, Oh, I'm, you know, sick or, or, or whatever. And I, I'm like, uh, but I want to go train. I'm like, why you're going to put together an absolute <laughs> dog shit training session your body's like working overtime just to fight whatever infection or you, you have or virus you have. And the, one of the craziest things there is like when you're sick, just check your heart rate, right? Like the last time I was sick, which happened to be COVID, but my heart rate was at like an 88 for like four days straight all day long, 24 yeah. seven. Yeah. Right. I did. Well, obviously I wasn't going to go to the gym and stuff because I had COVID, but like I do nothing. I sit on the couch. I just, watch Netflix or documentaries and I get, a, uh, I'll get a bunch of electrolytes in and I just sleep. Like you're probably not going to hit your macros you're, cause your appetite's going to be gone. Cause you're generally not going to be very, very hungry because your body's diverting resources to, you know, combating this illness. You just sleep fluids. I like to say fruit is probably going to be much more, uh, the kind of the ironically the lowest hanging fruit for, from a food standpoint, but you will probably come up very, very short on across all of your macronutrient targets because you're just not going to be that hungry. And I don't recommend force feeding it. So that is what I do. That is what I have my clients do. Brian, what do you recommend? Yeah, I actually couldn't imagine like wanting to train. So the question kind of confuses me because he's like fever and cough so hard not to do anything. When I have a fever, it's so hard for me to do anything. Like I, I can't even get out of bed. I'm like a baby. I just, uh, when I was, <laughs> my wife makes fun of me. Cause when I was, a, when I was a kid, my mom would put a bell next to my bed. And anytime <laughs> that I would need anything, I would just ring the bell. And she, she would come serve me. Um, and so my wife is like, I am never like, it's always a running joke. You do not get a bell. Like you're a grown ass man, you know? Um, <laughs> so so I don't get a bell, but I am a, a huge baby. And I think most males tend to be babies when, when they get fevers. Um, but I just lay in bed. Like I couldn't even, it's hard to walk. Like I, I wake, I have chills. I, I just like, I, everything feels weak and, and achy. Um, so when I have a fever, I, I personally can't do anything. I feel like if you're struggling to not do something, then your fever must not be that bad or you must run on like an extremely ADHD level. Uh, but I will say that once the fever dissipates, I'm usually pretty antsy to get back in and do something. Like I wouldn't say it's going and trying to like match numbers or anything like that, but I like to, you know, get back in and move once I feel able and ready to do so. Um, one example is the disease I just had, the hand, foot and mouth thing uh, a few weeks ago. I had an awful fever for like two days and it was like I explained I couldn't get out of bed and felt chills and all that stuff. The third day, 
the fever went away and my only symptom was this awful sore throat where I couldn't swallow or eat or drink or anything like that. But I felt like fully fine other than that. So I don't know. It was kind of like I went into the gym and I did my thing and I even matched my numbers and it wasn't a big deal. And that's kind of not a normal situation for me. Like usually when you have a fever, it takes a few days for your body to build back resilience and strength. Um, but this time I just was fine as soon as the fever broke and I was able to go. So I think every situation might be a little bit different. And I hear my daughter crying in the background. Um, so anyway, that's all I got on the, the fever and cough thing. Yeah. Uh, cool. Moving on. Uh, I believe this one's straight to you, Brian. How has your recovery been post cut with a little note saying great conditioning achieved, which I think we will all agree with. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. This is a question from my dude, Faz. I love him. Faz lifts on Instagram. If you guys follow him, uh, so recovery has been really good. I mean, training has been awesome. I think that, you know, per our discussion on the last episode where we compared our eating styles, um, I went a little off the rails as I kind of tend to do after three or four months of restriction. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I guess I did the 3DMJ recovery diet thing. Like I was like, hey, you know, 182 is too low for me. So let's get back up to 195 as quickly as we can. And um, that's pretty much what I did. So uh, recovery has been good. And, uh, I don't think I have a whole lot else to say. Like I discussed in the earlier part of this episode, how incredible the adaptations were in week one of this current, uh, meso cycle. And now, you know, we're like three or four months, actually, how far are we? Jay, July, August, September, October, we're like four or five months post cut at this point. Um, but yeah, I mean, everything's going great, dude. Thanks for asking. Cool. So this one, um, I'll read it to you and I have a, I have very limited, um, input on this one, so I'll kick it over to you, but palms toward you or palms down when performing face pulls. Yeah. So this is the question of, do you want your uh, palms facing each other like a neutral grip or do you want your palms down like a, a pronated grip? So, um, I actually, my inclination upon reading this was strictly that the neutral grip would allow you better external rotation at the shoulder. Like that seems relatively obvious to me, but I wasn't really sure beyond that of anything. Um, so, so I got on the internet and, and I checked out a few things and, uh, I respect, uh, John Russin, uh, R-U-S-I-N. If you guys don't follow him, he's, I would say as much a like strength training for health and longevity as much as kind of like a bit of understanding of like injury and pain management type stuff. So he had a really good uh, article on face pulls where he kind of um, what, what I said kind of resonated with what he was saying. So, so yes, the, the, the palms facing each other is going to facilitate more external rotation. Um, but he said that he primarily uses that as like a rehabilitative rehabilitative tool um, for people to work on external rotation at the shoulder, um, and said in the article that 90% of the time he tends to use the palms down position, um, which actually limits external rotation, but allows you to use a heavier load. And so, uh, that's kind of the way I look at it too. And then I also like that. I think at least personally, it seems like I'm getting a little bit more of that lateral delt in there with the palm down, because as you come up, the, uh, the shoulder is forced to kind of raise up and do a little bit of uh, shoulder elevation, which the lateral delt certainly helps with. Um, and then it just, it limits range of motion at the backside. So that's by not getting that external rotation that you get with the palms facing, it limits range of motion at the back, which is fine. You just have to be aware when you're doing your face pulls that you can't expect to get as much range of motion with palms down as you would with palms facing. Um, and then the last thing I would say is that if you do tend to have shoulder dysfunction, or you tend to be hunched in the shoulders, uh, then you may benefit by doing the neutral grip more because it can help you facilitate more external rotation, which can pull those shoulders back into place potentially. Yeah. Per, I mean, personally, I remember I just always inherently performed them, um, palms 
facing down like that, that kind of um, pronated position. I think because when I yeah. first was ever doing them, it was with a band and that was just like more intuitive to set up. And then I yep. at some point saw people doing them like, you know, with the palms facing each other. And I was like, oh, interesting. Let me try that. And immediately I was like, I, this just does feel strange to me. It felt like I was just kind of doing like a supinated bicep curl sort of thing. Yeah, so yeah, totally, totally. Kind of never did them that way again. I was like, I'm just going to stick to what feels, you know, intuitive and normal to me. So that's the yep. only thing I really have there. I'm really glad that someone asked this question though, because it forced me to actually kind of confirm Dig. what I thought and then have like a, a way of justifying it to people when this question comes up in the future. Yeah. Yeah. All cool. right. This one. Uh, well, is... the next question is. Yep. Go ahead. I was going to say this next one is for you, Brian. Uh, yep. Results, yep. thoughts so far on the one arm training experiment. I love all these questions about me. It makes, <laughs> it just really speaks to my narcissistic side. I just get to sit here and talk about myself all the time. Um, so the thoughts and results of the one arm experiment, it's been over two months now, not quite three months. So I'm not even halfway yet. Um, I committed to doing one arm training experiment for six months. For those that don't know, um, I'm continuing to do compound movements with both arms, like my rows and my presses and stuff, but any direct isolation work for biceps or triceps, I'm only using my left arm. Um, and the results and thoughts so far, I don't have any results. Um, the thoughts are that it feels weird post session. Um, having one side completely pumped is weird. It also, I don't want to say it's causing an imbalance because I think it's premature to say that, but anytime that you lift heavy close to failure with one side of your body, um, there's inevitably going to be some compensation that's occurring. So even though I'm trying to to isolate my bicep or my tricep in my movements, there's inevitably going to be some things going on in like my traps and my rhomboids and the scapula is moving to support the positions and all this stuff. And so I haven't tweaked anything or pulled anything or anything like that, but post session, sometimes I notice like an additional pressure in my like mid traps rhomboids area, um, after training just arms on one side. So that's not ideal. Um, but like ultimately it's not going to deter me from finishing this experiment, at least not at this point. Like if I were to tweak or pull something, maybe I'd have to reconsider it. But ultimately what I really want to do here is, is see what happens. Like I am so damn curious to figure out whether a, my right arm, the one that's not being trained is going to lose any size. And my hypothesis is that it's not. Um, and I'm also just as curious whether my left arm is going to gain any size. And my hypothesis is that it's not. Um, and so if we finish the six month period and literally I'm at the exact same place as when I started, which is no change to the left arm or the right arm, then I think I now have like a ton of things to think through. And there's like so many emotions attached to both of these in that if if nothing happens, then do I just settle into this nihilistic mindset of fuck, nothing matters. Like, do I even need to like do more than one or two sets per body part at all? And should I just like resign to, to not making progress at this point? Um, alternatively, if it does work, then I have a whole new slew of, of programming ideas to consider and specialization phases and more unilateral experiments. And I, I think there's just a lot of different ways that this can play out. And I'm just honestly super excited to see what happens and then kind of deal with the emotional roller coaster that follows that. That one is, uh, we got what, uh, about not, not quite four months, but not quite also three months until we get the final results here on that one. Yep. Yep. Um, cool. So next question is eight weeks of pull downs and then switch to barbell row for eight weeks. Home gym based. Good idea. Question mark. Do you want to take a stab at this one? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Why not both? Right. I think if you are doing, if let's say you're doing a three to three days per week, full body program, you're doing one movement per body part. 
yeah, maybe this is a decent approach. Even so, I would probably have vertical pull on one day, horizontal pull on another day. I can't really see in any real um, situation where purposefully excluding a um, Brian, can you help me out here? Is it, it's like it's like one of the core seven core movement patterns. Am I correct? Yeah, right? horizontal pull, vertical pull, horizontal push, vertical push, uh, knee dominant, hip dominant, six yeah. different core movement patterns. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I just why not have both, right? And unless yeah. if you're training like once per week and it's like, hey, I can only pick one, then I think this can be a good idea. But again, we have two different pulling planes of motion. I would include both if you are training more than once per week. Yeah, I agree. I think that there's a lot of information needed here as far as like what the setup is of the weekly uh, split and stuff like that. Uh, if it's home gym based and you have pull downs, then already you have way more options than than you potentially maybe think you have. Um, like if you have a cable, you can do vertical single arm pulls. You can do pull arounds versus pulls in the sagittal plane. You can do horizontal pulls. You can do low to high pulls, um, with both arms, with single arm across the body. Uh, yeah, barbell row is fine. If you want to change that out, I, I don't, it, it just, to me, it seems like there's probably a number of exercises you can choose. And so if barbell row is a great movement for you and you want to use that as one of your horizontal pulls, um, for, you know, mid back rear delt type thing, then, then I think that's fine. I don't have a problem with you using a barbell row for eight weeks instead of a, you know, wide grip pull down type thing. But, um, I think you also want to keep that in mind within the context of the other pulls that are in your program. Very well put. Yeah, buddy. Oh, this is such a good question. Uh, I'm curious what you think. I'll kick it over to you and then, and then, and I'll, I'll wrap it up. But, uh, what do you think the hypertrophy difference is between mental failure on a rep and muscular failure on a rep? In an acute standpoint of, of, of a set of an exercise, I, I would imagine it's probably marginal, if not menial. However, compounding over weeks, months and how that affects your proximity to failure in accuracy, I think is rather significant, um, especially as you move into the basically lower body training, right? We've kind of talked about this before, right? Like mental failure on a bicep curl versus muscular failures, like, I don't know, pr probably rather marginal to me. Talk about a hack squat or a leg press, I'd say you're probably not you, you know, person specifically, I'm speaking like a collective we at a population level. I, I dare to say that, you know, a, a mental failure on like a, a very rough set of leg press is probably like a four to five RIR. And if you're always stopping there, if we're considering the effective reps model, you're essentially scratching the surface sort of thing. So yeah. And, and on a set and at one set during the gym, Per, per, for a single gym session, probably not that big of a deal when you extrapolate that over multiple sessions per week over months and, and years. Um, I feel like you are leaving a lot on the table because everyone's like, I mean, the psychological psycho, psychology for so many of us breaks down well before physiology and like myself included, right? I'm not trying to act like I am excluded in that, but it has something that I've found through pushing myself and having other people push me that the mental failure does shut, shut it down rather quickly comparatively to what you're physically capable of. Yeah. I was going to say it similarly. Like it depends where your mental failure takes place. If your mental failure takes place one rep before muscular failure, then it's probably mostly the same. Like even long-term I'd, I'd be surprised if there's much difference. Like you could probably make up that difference by like once a month you do an extra set or something like that. Um, if that mental failure is occurring further from failure and if it's movement specific, like Aaron said, like if your mental failure is way further away on certain movements than it is on others, then yeah, we may have a problem long-term. So um, yeah, it's a good question. I think that uh, you just need to kind of 
try and meet those two in the middle somewhere uh, so that you're not failing mentally well before you're failing muscularly. Yeah. The, the um, last cool. kind of, yeah. sorry, the last thing I wanted to add there for this particular question asker or anyone out there listening, like this would be a great time to take like a um, uh, train with a partner for a number of weeks if you can, especially as you like go through mm. a, through a meso or something like that. And I think you will pleasantly surprise yourself when, you know, you feel like it's a one RIR and your training partners, like you got two or three left. And you're like, oh, one, it feels awful to mentally know that, that, but, uh, I would be rather surprised if you did not find that you actually in, in really, it did indeed have like two or three left, um, on, not on something like a bench press, but on some of the more challenging, um, mental movements. Yep. And if you don't have a partner that you can train with, then maybe just, you know, video your top set of each movement and watch the rep speed. Def. Yeah. All right. The next question is asking, what's the most optimal for lateral raises, dumbbells, cables, or machines? And I kind of feel like we've addressed this, maybe not directly, but I think we both pretty much feel that cables are going to be the most optimal for lateral raises because uh, they provide tension throughout the full range of motion. And you can align the cable up in the scapular plane, which is going to be approximately 30 degrees forward of directly to the side. Um Dumbbells are great aside from the fact that they're short overloaded. They do allow you to lift in the scapular plane. Uh, machines have the opposite problem where they probably have resistance in the full range of motion, but they potentially could inhibit your ability to lift in the scapular plane. So um, I think cables are going to be the most maneuverable there. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Um, I do think there is going to be a little bit of like performance bias that comes into this as well. Um, personally, I find it much simpler and for me to perform the, like a, a seated, like a seated dumbbell lateral raise is probably like my personal favorite because I can perform it really, really well. Mm -hmm. It's much harder for me to do the cable raises as well. Um, and some of that's mm -hmm. going to be equipment based, right? If, where, like if we're talking about a, a free motion where you can completely modify the cable to be exactly where you want. Yeah. But if your only cable options are in like your traditional 24 hour gym that has the like, you know, big rectangle cable stack, I think on paper, yes, cables are best, but I do believe the circumstance of your equipment availability, et cetera, is going to come into play there. Is what I really want to say. Yeah, I think the 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 to your point, the potential downside of cables, if there is one, is that you have to know how to position your body in space in relation to the cable to get yeah. the benefit of it. So, um, if you can't quite place your body optimally so that the cable lines up, you know, with your forearm throughout the range of motion and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then I think, yeah, you might be leaving something on the table there and maybe doing a movement that you connect with better, whether it's dumbbells or machines would be preferable. Yeah, really well put. All right. Uh, next question again, some lateral delt stuff here. Uh, overhead press and lateral delts, how much do they get worked? Is it meaningful? Um, I'll just stab at this and say that from what I understand of mechanics, the lateral delt primarily gets worked in the bottom range of motion. So from the very bottom where your um, shoulder is going, your elbow is going to be below uh, the horizontal line of gravity to the point where your elbow gets to the horizontal line of gravity. Um, you should have some tension on your side delt. As your elbow continues to ascend up and you get overhead, there will be meaningfully less tension on the side delt. Um, I guess on the positive side, the part that does work the side delt is the lengthened portion of the rep. However, we have to think about something like moment arms as well. So when you're looking at the, the overhead press, the moment arm is just from your elbow to your shoulder. So it's a very small moment arm of just the length of your upper arm. Um, and since the lateral delt essentially does abduction, meaning it raises your arm out to the side, um, when you start with an implement at your lower position by your waist and it's in your hand, and then you raise it out to the side, you're working effectively. The entire range of motion is, is targeting the lateral delt. Um, and it's got a longer moment arm. So 
Uh, I do think the overhead press can work up to a level, up to a certain point for your uh, lateral delts, but there will reach a point in your development probably where if you want to continue building your lateral delts, you're going to have to do uh, some lateral raises. And I would just equate this similarly to like, hey, squats are great. Squats will build your legs. Uh, but if you want to work your rec fem, like you probably should do some leg extensions. And I, I think it's kind of a similar analogy there. Yeah, I really don't have anything else to add on that. I uh, you, you did a really well, really good job covering Sweet. that. I'm going to kick this one over to you. Um, sure. Does colder weather increase neat slash brown fat activity? And then they said, I always go on morning walks, but now that it's colder, I find heart rate higher for the same activity. I, now, uh, everyone, please take this with a, with a grain of salt. I do believe I recently saw something saying that, yes, the, um, sorry, I don't, I don't think it's technically considered neat, um, because that's non-exercise activity thermogenesis. I think it would be actually considered basal metabolic rate. Now, granted, I'm into semantics here, but I do think your caloric expenditure does go up very modestly when in a colder environment. Um, so yes. Now on the brown fat activity, I believe there was some research on the like cold, cold plunges, cold baths around this. That's one of the purported benefits when you read like, um, not research articles, like your, you know, blog articles around. And that's something that people will always say, does it have a meaningful impact on body composition, body fat, I have a hard time uh, saying yes. Um, a little bit of anecdote uh, in the year of 2020, I did a year of only taking sh cold showers. Uh, I didn't take a hot shower for the entire year. Um, it was really wild what it does to how you feel in terms of cold. Now, I cannot say that this is from an increase in brown fat activity or maybe just being a lot, having a lot more experience of being cold and then it starts to kind of feel normal. But even through that winter, um, you know, as someone who doesn't, hasn't really lived in a winter in 10 years, I spent two months in Denver in, in November and December and I was like not cold. I was really, really surprised about my ability to adapt there. Um, granted, I don't know how much that has to do with exactly neat or brown fat activity, but um, there does seem to be some supporting evidence there. How strong that is, I, I wouldn't feel confident saying it's overly strong. Brian, what do you think? Yeah. So I actually, I have a theory on this and, and it, it, it may, I, somebody will have to, to write on the podcast and let us know if this is actually supported, but it makes sense that your body would have to work harder to heat itself than to cool itself, given the temperature variance of our environment. So what I mean by that is our body is 98.6 degrees at homeostasis. When it's hot outside, it's, 100, 101, 102, you know, it's a few degrees hotter than what our body temperature naturally runs at. When it's cold outside, it's like 50 degrees colder than what our body runs at. So, so we, in theory, would have to work a lot harder to get our body temperature back up to homeostasis when it's cold out than to cool it when it's hot out. So when I saw this question, that was literally like the first thing I thought of. And um, I don't know if that's right, but, but it seems to be right. And then uh, I'll also notice that in colder weather, I, I do tend to have slightly higher heart rate for the same activity as well. Um, so yeah, for whatever that's worth, I think that that at least anecdotally supports the question. Before moving on, I actually do have something. Um, what you were saying, Brian, reminded me there was a study. Um, they took people, they, they, they exercised in like 40, 50 degree temperatures and then they took the same like people and they exercised in like hot yoga esque like kind of temperatures. And what they found is when it was really, really hot, um, your body basically like down regulates its caloric expenditure, um, for whatever reasons. But so essentially working out in like 40 degree temperature, you were burning more calories than working out in like 110 degree temperature. So when people are in the gym and like, you know, um, 
fucking sweatpants and a sweatshirt and a headband and all this shit to like really get really, really sweaty. It, it, this particular uh, study was basically stating that that is actually counterproductive. Yeah. And I think it's counterintuitive a little bit too, because I think that your layman general population person will look at the acute response of what happens from a training session. And so if you do hot yoga in 110 degrees and you sweat out four pounds of water, then you're going to stand on the scale and be like, oh my God, I burned so many calories and lost so much weight. Uh, whereas if you're cold and you do that and stand on the scale, nothing happens acutely. Um, but that is uh, just some information to think about. Yeah. Anything else? Not on that one, no. Cool. Um, is there any accuracy to the notion that a walk after eating increases glucose uptake? Yes, I, I believe there is. I think to the scale that you may feel this benefit um, is going to vary person to person. Uh, so in theory, right, we intake glucose, right? Our body is then going to secrete insulin to find a home for this glucose, hopefully in our muscle and liver glycogen and not in creating, you know, um, uh, adipose tissue stores. If we go for a walk afterwards, we are using some of the largest muscles in our legs, right? Our glutes, our hamstrings, a little bit of quad, calves, essentially using some of that glycogen so that the food that we had just eaten, we have just freed up some homes for the new glucose to go. Obviously not nearly to the degree of something like a training session would. Um, what you can do to test this personally, uh, each of you guys out there listening, is get a glucometer, right? This is something that is going to measure our blood glucose levels. And then you can have a single meal. Let's say it's your normal lunch. And then you can, have 30 minutes after that meal, you can test your blood sugars. Uh, 60 minutes after, you can test your blood sugars. That's your kind of baseline. Then you can eat that meal and go for a 15 minute walk and then test again at that 30 and 60 minute mark and see if there is any difference in your blood glucose levels. So I believe there is accuracy to it. Um, and then the really fascinating part is we can test that to for each of you out there listening who may be interested. And your hypothesis would be that for most people broadly across the population that they would see some improvement from taking that 15 minute walk and then testing. Potentially. I think it really speaks to the type of population. Um, I think the majority, if I were to make an assumption, which I really hate doing uh, at the listenership of Eat, Train, Prosper, I would be, I think any difference would be rather marginal, if I'm being completely honest. Um, if you were to have now, let's say, we were on a like a literal gen pop america podcast i think that difference moves from the marginal to meaningful so i think it's really kind of the population dependent and speaks more so to the other factors in your um mm -hmm. lifestyle yep yep good well said. I uh, personally am not sure about the glucose piece. I think it, like Aaron said, I think it would make sense in theory. Um, but I will also add that I love walks after meals, especially larger meals, um, because I actually notice significant impact on improved digestion. So if I just eat a big meal, like, you know, I'm in the middle of my work day, it's noon and I go and eat like a big thing of like chicken rice and fruit or whatever, and then go sit right back down and start working again. I, I don't feel great. Uh, but if I finish that meal and go for a 10 minute brisk walk and then go sit down and do my work, uh, it's significantly better. So, you know, end of one. Yeah. Well, walking is last part here. Walking is parasympathetic, right? And parasympathetic mm -hmm. is, uh, another, uh, layman's term is rest and digest, right? Um, so much of work in, in modern day society is sympathetic, right? Uh, which is fight or flight. So we digest food better in a state of parasympathetic. So going for a walk after that, um, and again, in theory makes perfect sense as to why you digest better after by spending more time in the parasympathetic. Yep. Cool. Uh, two more questions to go. I'll kick this one over to you. What does tracking all macros give you that tracking just calories and protein does not? 
accuracy, <laughs> um, more like tightly coupled control over what you would like to do. The, the way I like to answer this, and this is something where I feel like I'll just, I'll just get into it. Like calories in calories out is the beginning of the sentence. It is not the entirety of the sentence. Um, coming back to that same sort of person that, that we were just talking about they, at a population that would benefit from the post walk, um, where they maybe do not have great, uh, insulin sensitivity. Maybe they're insulin resistant. Maybe they have poor glucose, um, uh, tolerability telling that person, Hey, just, you know, track your protein and eat calories. It's a great start, but we know that that person does not tolerate a lot of carbohydrate. Well, maybe they have because of the insulin resistance, they would do much better off with a higher fat diet. Um, even with calories, you know, from an energy balance standpoint, there's more that our body does with nutrients and the macronutrients than simply calorie balance. Um, uh, additionally, if you have someone who has like dysbiosis, a, um, a, a imbalance of the different types of bacteria in the gut microbiome, generally carbohydrates are the largest kind of trigger of this because they are fermentable. So again, someone like this is going to do better with a higher fat diet, specifically like pro uh, or sorry, anti-inflammatory fats, like an extra virgin olive oil and different uh, foods that are specifically high in like polyphenols and flavanols as then like, Hey, just track your protein and get your calories in. Um, assuming that someone's like, there's no digestive issues. We have great blood glucose control and they are in a calorie surplus. I think the, the benefits of fats versus carbohydrate, um, are much less so. Um, but even in a calorie deficit, uh, even with an isocaloric and an isoprotein standpoint for people who are very, very performance focused, recovery focused, um, body composition focused, having a higher carbohydrate intake relative to fat is going to help with satiety, recovery from training, fueling training sessions. Um, so at a very, very top level gen pop standpoint, I think it's, you know, just tracking protein and calories is probably adequate, assuming that hunger and satiety isn't a factor, which very, uh, very, uh, what's whatever the opposite of often very infrequently, is that actually a true statement? Um, but the more nuanced you get with goals and individuality, the more beneficial, um, being targeted with your carbohydrate relative to fat can be. Yeah, I agree. I'm not going to waste time to add anything to that. I think you really <laughs> nailed it. So, um, so we're going to move on to the final question, which <laughs> is on leg curls. And, uh, the question is, should I just do the seated version all the time, even if lying is programmed and what's the deal with standing leg curls? Um, so essentially the deal is, with these different variations of leg curls is that, uh, one variation, the seated variation puts you in a hip flexed position. So your, your hip is flexed, your, your torso is leaning forward. And then the lying leg curl puts you in a hip extended position. Um, some of those lying leg curls have one of those weird kind of like pyramid style setups. So you're in like a very small amount of hip flexion as your body kind of braces over the little triangle setup, but most of them are pretty flat for the most part. And they definitely don't get you into as much hip flexion as a seated leg curl does. And so why this matters is that, uh, we have that study by Mao and colleagues, I believe, um, where they compared seated leg curls to lying leg curls. And they found across the spectrum that seated leg curls produce more hypertrophy. Um, however, there's definitely some nuance to this. Uh, the first piece of nuance is that the lying leg curl actually stretches the sartorius muscle, uh, which the seated leg curl does not. So the lying leg curl actually grew the sartor sartorius muscle more than the seated leg curl, but the seated leg curl grew uh, like three of the other hamstring heads more than the lying leg curl did. Um, second concern of, of nuance here is that a seated leg curl 
trains you at long muscle lengths, similarly in this hip flex position to what you would get in a hip hinge, like an RDL type movement. So as far as programming goes, if you have a day where you're doing a hip hinge, it might make sense for you to pair that with a lying leg curl or a standing leg curl. Um, I haven't addressed the standing leg curl yet, but essentially a standing leg curl puts you in a similar position to the lying leg curl, uh, where you're in a hip extended position. So you could basically consider the standing leg curl to be an equivalent to a lying leg curl as far as, um, it's stimulus on the, the target musculature. Um, so then if you have a day of training where you don't have a hip hinge in there, then maybe it would make more sense to do the seated leg curl because then you get a little bit of that training at long muscle lengths, uh, stretch media, hypertrophy and length and overload a little bit more than you would get if you just chose to do a standing or a lying leg curl on that same training day. Uh, so over the course of the spectrum of your program, I think it makes a ton of sense to have both a seated and a lying or standing leg curl in there at some point, like they don't have to all be in there every cycle. Um, but like for me, I did a cycle last meso where I had only seated leg curls. And then this meso I introduced standing leg curls because I don't have a lying leg curl. So the standing leg curl is kind of my replacement for that hip extended uh, leg curl position. And the other thing I like about the, um, lying and standing leg curl is that they tend to inherently be a little bit more short overloaded. So you can focus a little bit more on the contraction position, which I personally love as far as sequencing goes in training, going from short to lengthened overload movements, whether that's going from a uh, leg extension with a pause at the contraction and then a hack squat second, uh, or in the example of leg curls, doing like a short overloaded uh, leg curl and then either going into a lengthened overload leg curl or into a hip hinge. Um, so I think those would kind of be the, the differences and the programming considerations. I, there's, there's nothing more. I think I could add onto that one. I, I, you, you covered everything that I had thought to say, um, <laughs> really, really well. Yeah. Um, cool. I, Sweet. Yeah. It's really, really well done. Well, we got through it. We got all we, the questions done. We did. And shout out. Uh, you know what? I'm not going to shout out because I generally rise and pisses me the, the hell off. But I will have to say they did do a good job the last two episodes of um, allowing me to record this episode entirely through uh, tethering to my phone's LTE. So there is that. <laughs> there you go. Shout out Verizon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Finally get something right for, for once. Um, right. Cool. So as always, guys, thank you for listening. Brian will be back. Brian and I will be back next week. And then just a little bit of a heads up the week between um, the Christmas and New Year's, Brian and I will be taking a week off. It is planned. So when that week comes, you do not have to uh, reach out to me asking if we are both okay because there's no podcast episode <laughs> that week. That's right. Um, lo lo well, love our listeners. They're the best. <laughs> <laughs> it was, that one was really good. I was like, yes, Brian and I are both fine. I was just like, I think it was like the week I moved to Bali. And I was like, we just, we couldn't line it up this week. There will be another one next week. <laughs> We are not okay. There's no <laughs> <cheap> password. <laughs> cool. All right, guys. Thanks again. We'll talk to you next week.